A lot to be proud of. I think our players overcame a lot of adversity in different ways. I think our coaches uh, had a lot to deal with week to week. And I'm very proud of the, the way that they handled the, the roster churn and all the adversity that they dealt with and the amount of injuries that we had and some of the other challenges along the way. I want to thank Steve Bishotti for his support, Dick Cass for his guidance, uh, the scouting staff, uh, Ozzie Newsom, uh, Nick Matteo, Pat, George, Joe, um, the trainers and doctors. Uh, they were quite busy this year. Um, they did a great job in many respects and had to overcome a lot of challenges on their own. Um, Megan McLaughlin, who it's kind of one of the unsung heroes for what we do here with COVID uh, over the last couple of years. All the various protocols and adjustments day to day. Um, Megan's really a point person and she does a great job. Um, I'd like to thank Jen, my assistant, and also uh, my wife, Lacey, for uh, dealing with me this season, which was probably a challenge for her as well. Um, I also want to thank the fans. One of the things I'd say about this season is we heard you to our fan base. Uh, I thought the atmosphere and the environment at our games was great. Um, some of those night games were magical and uh, very exciting and some experiences that I'll never forget. And I want to thank you guys as well for covering the team, uh, providing a resource for our fans. Your opinions, your insight uh, is valuable to our fan base and to the community at large. So um, with that, I can take questions. Eric, um, obviously one of the big uh, storylines, as you know, is Lamar and his contract extension. Uh, where do talks stand with that, and do you expect something to be completed before the start of this uh, regular season? Oh, man. Well, the first thing I would say is this is an unusual uh, negotiation because it, uh, I've been dealing with a player, and I would never divulge a conversation with a player. Um, so. For me to talk about in specifics would be would be prohibitive. Um, what I can say is that Lamar and I have had probably, I don't know, five or six conversations at different points over the last mm, year uh, in regards to his contract. Um, we picked up his option, as you know. Uh, I think at this point, um, I would say that we're working at Lamar's pace. He's comfortable where we are right now. Uh, I think he feels that uh, we have a lot of unfinished business. He has a lot of unfinished business. He wants to win the division. He wants to win the Super Bowl. I think he and I both share that same vision. And so, um, you know, that's basically where we stand. There's a great line of communication. I know that Lamar knows he can come up to see me at any point. He can call me at any point. Uh, we actually talked this week. Um, he can text me at any point, and uh, we will operate based on his urgency. And so uh, that's basically where we stand. You know, I think right now we want to see Lamar get healthy, and we have a lot of different things we have to work on as a team. The offense is a big part of that, but there are a lot of other things we have to focus on as well. Eric, you thought of the team. As you look at your building your 22 roster, what, what are your priority areas that you want to address first? Well, we've got some work to do in a lot of different areas. Uh, I think everything is fixable and it can be improved and built and strengthened for sure. Uh, first thing we've got to do is uh, look at the salary cap. We spent some time down in uh, the Caribbean last week, I guess it was. We discussed the salary cap. We discussed contracts. We discussed potential deals, ways of freeing up more money. I think we'll have enough room, a salary cap room, to do everything we need to do, uh, to do responsible, good deals that work for the club and also work for the player. Um, you know, we've never been a big, a huge free agency team. We've dabbled in it a little bit. We'll continue to look for players that benefit the club in different ways. Um, certainly, uh, right player, right price, as always. We'll continue to look at players that we have that whose contracts are expiring to try and get some deals done. I'm comfortable with that process. And we're excited. We've got nine draft picks at this time in the first four rounds. You know, we're not sure exactly how that's going to break down, where those picks will be in the first four rounds, but we know we have nine picks in the first four rounds. And for me, as I look at it and as we project on, we model and see where those picks will fall. If, if you think about our list, our master list, if we've got 100 players 
uh, ranked. We feel like all of those nine picks will probably come within our top 80 players. So if we do our job correctly, if we stack the board the right way, if we're able to play the combinations correctly, and what I mean by that is drafting the players um, with an eye towards maximizing each pick positionally, I think we have a really good chance to build some serious and quality depth to help this team be the best it can be. Hey, Eric, to, uh, to follow up on Lamar, it, when you, you say you're dealing with him, uh, is his mom still representing him? Do you talk to her at all? And is that unusual to have to deal with a player? And also, he recently endorsed Antonio Brown. Do you have a stance on that, on, on him? And you know Antonio Brown has been all over social media clamoring to be a rape. Has he? Yeah, he posted several pictures of himself in Ravens gear. Oh, I, haven't, I haven't seen that. But what I will say is, uh, first of all, um, I've, always, I've always spoken to Lamar. You know, uh, it was made clear to me early on in the process that Lamar and I would, would work together. And so that's been the case. And he and I have a great relationship. I'm very proud of the relationship that we have. Um, you know, that was one thing. I think I told you guys when I first took over and replaced Ozzy, uh, one of the things that always gave me anxiety was how would I relate to the players and how would the players relate to me? Because we're a lot different in a lot of ways. And, you know, Ozzy's a Hall of Famer, basically, in every Hall of Famer there is known to mankind, he's in it. And so uh, that was something that gave me anxiety, was kind of like dealing with the players day to day. And I would have to say, Jerry, that's probably one of the most fulfilling aspects of the job now for me. So I'm very comfortable with the relationship that I have with Lamar. I think he would say the same thing. And I think the line of communication is great. Um, your second question in regards to other players, um, what I can say is that um, I'm very comfortable where we are at the receiver position. And I think people saw last year a lot of growth at that position. Um, we had a nice mix of younger players who continued to improve throughout the year. And um, we'll look at ways of augmenting that position group, but uh, I would not expect any significant additions at this time. That can always change, but at this time, I think we're very comfortable where we are with that group. Related to that, Marquise Brown, uh, option to do a read by May at 12, 13 million in that ballpark. Do you anticipate picking up that fifth year option on him? I do. Mm -hmm. Eric, the uh, Excuse me? The Bengals, they mm -hmm. won a division in the Super Bowl. Do you sort of fill the rosters, and they have $56 million in cap room, I think, next year. Do you sort of fill the roster and encounter them, or you just do things the Ravens way as far as you're, you're going to be the Ravens, not so much worried about you know, the competition the division? Well, I, I think that's a good question. You know, it's kind of like Sun Tzu, you know, studying your enemies. And I think we've got to look at all the best teams and how do we beat the best teams. And obviously the Bengals are one of the best teams right now. They were a very tough team to defend. They've got excellent skill position players. Uh, they've improved quite a bit and they've got a quarterback that is fantastic. So we'll have to find ways of adjusting what we do to play them most efficiently and effectively. And we'll do that. Um, not unlike challenges that we've had in the past, you know, in the early part of John's tenure as a head coach, the Steelers were a great team and, you know, still are. But in a lot of ways, we had to find a way to compete and beat those guys. And so it's always evolving. It's always changing. You look at the very best teams, you know, whether it's, the, you know, over the last, you know, 15 years, the Patriots, the Chiefs, the, you know, who the Steelers, now the Bengals, and find a way to beat those guys. What, what updates are you hearing on Ryan Stanley's rehabilitation? And how does that impact how you view offensive tackle? It seems like, I mean, you guys have a lot of inventory, a lot of guys with potential, but a lot of guys with very serious questions, whether you know, performance or health in, in the case of Stanley. How does that impact you know, not being in the position you were this year with him? Sure. I think well, if he doesn't get back 100%. Yeah, well, that's, it's a good question. Um, you know, it's something that I've thought about quite a bit, you know, and it's probably my mistake. Um, I don't want to use assuming, but expecting that Ronnie would come back this year full strength. And unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And, uh, you know, there's probably a lot of blame to go around. Ultimately, I'm the guy that has to talk to the various doctors and trainers and make a decision, a determination at that position. And my understanding and belief was that Ronnie would come back this year and play really good football for us and be healthy and be strong and be ready to go. And he wasn't. Uh, that was a big setback. And uh, I'm proud of the way the guys fought through. I'm proud of the, the fact that we could battle through that, losing one of your very, very best players, losing a significant amount of salary cap to an injury like that. Um, you know, I can't really comment on his rehab at this point, um, but I'm, I'm optimistic, and I truly believe that Ronnie's going to be back this year and play good football, play winning football, and become, again, 
the Ronnie Stanley that was an all-pro left tackle. And if he can do that, that'll be a huge, huge advantage for us moving forward. That being said, um, you know, one of the probably points of emphasis this year is the offensive line. And how do we improve? How can we get better? Certainly, the draft will be one resource. There will be other ways as well. Some of that is going to be guys we have on campus. Um, and them getting better with an off season. Some of these young guys maturing and developing into the players we expected them to be when we drafted them. So the burden's on them. Um, we have a couple other guys that we brought in this past year that we're excited about. We haven't really seen them play yet, tackles. Um, but we're excited about what these guys might have a chance to do. Uh, I think just in general, what we do know is for us to be the very best offense we can be, we've got to have a strong, commanding offensive line that can control people at the point of attack. Eric, you, you referenced the injuries, just, just the volume of them. You've never really had the team you thought you were going to have on, on, on the field. Um, how much harder does that make it to assess where you are as you look to next season? Well, we've always had injuries, and so we, there is a process in place, and we have to listen to our doctors and trust our doctors and trainers and, and really get good feedback from them. And also part of my job is to communicate daily with the injured players to see where they are. Um, it can be challenging, you know. Um, for instance, you know, at the running back position, uh, two of our best players, Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins, seizing ending injuries within a week of each other, uh, and then Justice Hill. So we're a little bit right now in a situation of, you know, when do these guys come back? And we have a lot of confidence that they will come back, but the timing is such that we're just not sure when they will come back. So then the question begs, well, how do they address that position? You have to have some running backs. You have to have some guys who can carry the ball for you, especially us. We're a running team. So it's definitely a hard thing. It does complicate things. I think that you rely on your medical people. Uh, I think we're blessed to have uh, Dr. Tucker, Dr. Andy Tucker here on staff who can counsel me as, and give me an approximation as to how these guys are doing. Uh, that's certainly a big part of it. And then I think I have to be flexible enough, uh, whether it's the draft or free agency or you know, after the draft, whatever it might be, um, to look for players who can help the team at any position and not really necessarily be in a situation where we feel like we're content, you know, that we're always looking at value and looking at the talent that's out there and having the flexibility to go after those types of players. One of my regrets this year is that when the salary cap went down to um, whatever it was, 182 million, I think, or something in that range, that you know, hurt our ability to be flexible during the season. And then when we got hit with all these injuries, as we did, as you all know, we then took on a lot more uh, money on the cap. We had to bring, sign more players. We had to activate a lot more players. We had to elevate more guys on game day. Uh, that's not ideal in terms of building um, what I would call a nest egg of money that you have in season to make a move. Hypothetically, you want to make a trade. We had opportunities this year to potentially pull the trigger on some trades. But we didn't have the money to actually do it. And so one of the decisions you have to make as a GM is do you mortgage the future to make a short-term trade? Could we have done that? Probably we could have. Um, other teams have done it with some success. You know, but our philosophy, my philosophy, is that um, the idea of taking on dead money each year is probably not a great philosophy. And you can see if you look at other team situations, and you'll see teams this year um, that are in very, very tough uh, financial straits. I don't want that to be us. Steve doesn't want that to be us. John doesn't want that to be us. Dick Cass doesn't want that to be us. So we try and do responsible deals uh, that where both teams, both sides can win, meaning players and organization. And there are some mechanisms that we just won't do. We just won't include in contracts because we feel that they're irresponsible for the club. They may look good in the short term, but they won't look good in the long term. You mentioned you said this last year we're a running team. Lamar talked about wanting to pass more. John on, on Monday said that you guys probably won't make that 2019 run half balance as prominent next year. So to you, what does we're a running team mean in the, the big picture sense? Well, we're a physical team. You know, I think one of the more satisfying things is when you have the lead in the fourth quarter and you can control the ball for seven minutes and end the game running the football down the field. You've seen us do that. Um, I like the idea of it being balanced. I like the idea of always keeping the other team guessing, you know, avoiding the second and 15s and having to throw, you know. Being second and four, that's a good thing, you know. Um, being able to push people off the ball, that's a good thing. Being a strong, physical offensive line that can 
run the ball effectively, and also protect the quarterback, that's a good thing. Keeping the other team off balance is, is what you aspire to on every uh, play, in every game. And being a running team is part of that. Having the flexibility to run the football or pass the football effectively in any situation based on the skills that you have on the field, that's a heck of a thing. And how that is so important for, for an offense going forward. How much change do you think there will be on the offensive line throughout the whole offense? You know, I think we probably add two guys, possibly, potentially. You know, it's hard to say. I mean, there's always going to be a lot of moving parts. Yeah, if the right player comes available, we probably make a move. You know, we were very happy last year when Kevin Zeitler became available, and uh, and we pounced. And I think that's kind of what our mindset is. If we're in the draft and there's a guy there at 14 and we like him, we'll take him. If we're comfortable trading back to 20, thinking a guy might be there and he's an offensive lineman, then we'll take him. Uh, if there happens to be a cap casualty on March 18th and that guy looks like he can make our team better, then we'll probably try to swoop in. Um, that's basically our mindset. If a team calls us and offers a guy and we have the draft capital to make it happen, potentially that's something that we might look at. So there's a lot of different ways to build a team. For me, it always is based on the fit of the player. How does he fit what you do? Does he fit your culture? Do you have a need and can you afford him? Eric, uh, at the risk of uh, beating the dead horse here, um, two-part question on Lamar contract. You said last year you guys were comfortable with what this is going to cost and all that. So the first part of the question is, has anything that's happened over the last four months, whether it's his health, uh, some of the health questions or some of the struggles of offense, has that impacted where you guys stand in terms of, you know, believing he will be here going forward? And the second part would be, are you comfortable going in the last year, the fifth year option with the challenges that would create in the cap? Yeah, well, uh... You know, I, nothing has changed, okay? Lamar's a Pro Bowl quarterback. He played some brilliant football this year, and we had some struggles. And certainly, as a group, when you consider the, the turmoil that we had in the offensive line at the running back position, um, you know, that's a factor. You know, Lamar's health this year, he had some issues. He was sick, he hurt his foot, and all those different things. We had a lot of different injuries, a lot of different things that we dealt with. So I think there's a lot of upside with our offense. Lamar's a big part of that. He's the right person to do it. He's a leader, he's beloved. He's a phenomenally talented player, and uh, he makes us better. So um, that's what I would say on that. Um, as far as the fifth-year option amount, $23 million, I think it is maybe. Um, listen, we have the cap room. Uh, we'll have more cap room uh, at the beginning of the new league year. We'll be flexible. We'll have an ability to make some moves. We can certainly take on that amount, and, uh, you know, based on – who Lamar is and what he has to offer, that's not a huge ticket for a quarterback of that ability and of that uh, personality and what he brings to the table for the team. Eric, at this point in his career as your hopeful long-term franchise QB, how much influence does he have on you when it comes to bringing in you know, recommendations, suggesting players, whether it be in free agency or through the draft? Well, you know, I'm all ears. If we have veteran players, it's all veteran players. You know, I'm fortunate enough that guys will come in and say, hey, can I come on upstairs and talk to you? They have opinions. They have situations. They have uh, ideas. Uh, I even had a parent of a player reach out to me last week about a college player that they saw, who they like. Um, so, you know, I've learned over the last 26 years that uh, it's good to listen to people and consider other ways of doing things. I think when you... In a, in a static position for a long time, that's kind of when you start to falter. And so uh, I appreciate the opinions of our players. I appreciate the opinions of our coaches, um, other people. And I think that's what helps me look at all the various things to plot strategy and find out what's best for the club. Eric, uh, you watched the football last week, and all four teams can get after the quarterback. Are you comfortable with the pass rush you currently have in the building, and how big a priority is it to improve uh, that pass rush? Well, it's always a priority to improve the pass rush. Uh, I think this year what we saw was uh, some good play from Tyus before the injury, unfortunately. Uh, Odafe, we're very excited about him. Uh, you know, he had a good rookie season, and we expect a lot more this year. Um, I think we'll be in position where we're picking in that range between 14 and 20 if we stick, you know, if we stay in that range uh, to get a really good pass rusher if the situation presents itself as well. So, uh, you know, uh, right here today, the fourth, I think it is, 
I don't know, I could probably tell you the three guys that we would probably get if we stayed at 14, that we would take. It'd probably be four, three or four players that will be there when we pick. Various positions. Um, but I think we'll be in an excellent position to get a guy who can come in and impact the club very quickly. So, uh, you know, pass rush, believe me, there's nobody that appreciates pass rushers more than me. You know, uh, and I've seen some great ones here. And I'm optimistic and excited. You know, fortunately, we got a chance to take Odafe last year. We think his future is very bright. And I'm excited that we also got Tyus Bowser under long-term contract last year. And that he'll be back, in my opinion, full strength, ready to go at the start of training camp. Were some of the picks that you're talking about the ones you talked about on Twitter? No, I'm, I'm just kidding about the Twitter <laughs> thing. Uh, as far as offensive linemen, going back to Ronnie's family, were you able at the time you did this contract to be able to get disability insurance on him just in case? Was that purchased at the time? Anything of that like? Uh, you know, we wouldn't talk about a specific contract, Jerry. You know, just out of deference to the player and privacy laws and various things like that. Um, but we always try and do what's best for the club in those situations. Um, you know, so we, we do whatever we can to protect the club. And also, if we can protect the player, we'll do that as well. Going back to the defensive front for, for a second. Um, would you, or, or, I mean, have you, have you talked to Calais Campbell since the season ended? It, it, would you at least talk to him about maybe wanting him back on a, on a short-term deal? And just looking at that defensive front in general, are you expecting a lot of turnover there? Or are, you, are you expecting to get younger? Well, we need to get younger for sure. You know, uh, we have a lot of, this year we had a lot of grizzly war horses up there up front. Um, Calais and I did talk after the season. He came up and we spent some time talking. It'll be more discussions that we have. Uh, I really admire Calais as a leader, as a player. He still plays at a high level. He's got a great attitude. He's great for the younger guys. Uh, I'm excited, you know, about, uh, you know, some of the other guys we have as well um, that we think will make the next step. Uh, and But I would say that the defensive line is definitely something that as we looked out, you know, two years ago uh, last year, we felt like 2022 would probably be the year that we would have to find some you know, more young guys, you know, we did bring in Justin a couple of years ago. We brought in Broderick Washington, who made a nice jump this year. But we do, we did feel that this would be the year that we would probably be looking at defensive linemen as well. Special teams right number one in the NFL. What, what, uh, how important has Chris Horton uh, come to the staff as far as the uh, John Humboldt staff? He's great. He's great. Uh, he's an excellent coach. Great personality. Uh, experience as a player. I think players relate to him very well. He's detailed. He's passionate. Uh, you know, the only thing that he can't do is beat me on the peloton, really. That's about the only thing he can't do. But other than that, he's, 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 he's great in my mind. You mentioned the Caribbean. Steve thinks uh, Steve doesn't meet with us anymore. We don't get questions. This is the closest we're going to get. What does Steve think right now about the season and about the injuries? And um, I guess there's no plans for him to take questions from us. So I'll ask you, what, what's on Steve's mind? When you spend a few days with him? Uh, you know, I wouldn't really want to talk about my conversations, the personal conversations that I have with Steve. I think as a group, um, I think as a group, what we're, you know, consumed with going into this season is what can we do to get better, okay? How can we stay healthy? Looking at everything. And some of that's on me, you know? How do we find healthy players or players that will be durable when they get here? How can we protect our players? Um, you know, is there technology out there? Is it the way we practice? Is it the training room? Is it the doctors? Is it how our players rehab? Is it how our players train? Is it the way we um, treat the off season? Is it the way we practice? I think we'll look at all that stuff and we'll, and we'll, we'll own it. Uh, I think that was a big point of emphasis that we had as we talk as a group. Um, and then, you know, where do we see ourselves this year? Where do we see ourselves three, four, five years from now? That's my role as GM. What's the salary cap? How's the salary cap gonna affect us this year? Um, understanding there was a jump this year, but the cap is still hasn't recovered. You'll still see this year, I believe, projecting out a tremendous amount of volatility on rosters with players getting cut, cap deals, restructures. It's going to be just like last year. And how do we adjust to that changing landscape? Those would be the types of things that we talk about um, when we're down there. And then specific contracts, obviously. You're always talking about players. You're always looking out. You're looking back at deals you've done, were those good deals, were those bad deals? You're looking back at the you know, trades you've done or the drafting or the picks and different things. It's really just a way of looking at something through an organizational lens, trying to assess where you're succeeding, where you're failing, and what you can always do better. 
Uh, you mentioned, uh, I think Bill was asking about Marquise Brown picking up his fifth year option. You answered that pretty quickly, yes. What would have been your thoughts in Marquise's development and why you, you know, seem very confident that you, know, you, you want him back on the contract next year? Well, first of all, you know, Marquise was my first pick. Um, and I think very highly of Marquise. I think he's a talent. I love his personality and his competitiveness and his passion. Um, I think he had over 90 catches this year, just over 1,000 yards. Um, but I like his energy that he brings. And uh, quite honestly, for his skill set, um, for what he brings to the table, the, the fifth year option in my mind, if you look at receivers and what they're making now, it looks like a bargain. And uh, he's just a nice piece. And honestly, if we didn't bring him back, we'd be trying to find another receiver. And I'd really hope that this year maybe I wouldn't get as many questions about receivers as I've been getting over the years. So he's a big part of me stopping you guys from asking me so many questions about receivers, although here we are again, I'm still getting questions about receivers. Um, but, uh, but so that's what I would say on him. He, he's, a, he's a great uh, person. He plays uh, the game the right way. I think he's got a high care factor. And I still think, I still believe there's a lot of upside there, you know, and I think he would say the same thing. He hasn't played his best football. Um, and I would say that about most of our guys. And that's why I'm excited because I think we're going to get that this year. When you have a team that's, uh, when fully healthy, one of the better teams in the league, how do you, going into the off season, how do you balance uh, trying to, the importance between getting a guy that can benefit the team right now as opposed to the long-term picture? Yeah, that's a, that's a hard question. Um, you know, I think the challenge is always, uh, are we being patient enough? You know, when we look at our players, we see that all of our players develop at different stages. And so some guys come out of the gates right away, boom, like a Odafe. And, you know, you can see right away, this guy's going to be really good. Other guys might develop a little bit different. Tyus would be a great example, same position group. Um, they develop at a, at a slower pace, but when they do, you're like, man, this guy's really good. As an organization, we've always got to push the guys to develop as quickly as possible, but also be um, patient enough to know that we've got to give them the chance to get there. Everybody's different. All of our players are totally different. Personality, ability, motivation, drivers, uh, off the field, family situations, where they grew up, how they grew up, all those different things factor into how guys play initially and how they play long term. And so um, as we're building a team, one of the worst things that we can do is, 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 is make a move, bring a guy in, and then the guy behind him emerges quickly. And then all of a sudden we have two guys for one spot. That's a frustrating thing when that happens. And it's happened over the years. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. So what we try to do, one of the biggest jobs we have is assessing our players. What do we have currently? Evaluating the players on campus. What are they going to be? Where are they going to go? How fast are they going to get there? In some cases, we make the determination we don't have the right guy yet. We have to find that guy to do that. Um, hopefully, if that's the case, the guy we bring in is good and can play right away, and he's everything we think he's going to be. He's instant coffee. Um, but sometimes, you know, the guys have to percolate for a while, and then they become really good. And so the challenge is really, as we go through the season, um, for me to assess and to be around the guys enough to know their personalities, to talk to the coaches, to get a sense for their strengths and weaknesses so that after the season, we can make a clear determination as to what their value is going to be moving forward. If you balance the cap situation, um, I think the outside perception is your three biggest free agents, at least in, um, in terms of younger guys, are Averitt, Ricard, and Bozeman. Do you f you're, you've long said that you want to keep your own guys. Uh, do you feel like you have the financial resources or the cap room, I should say, to make a good run at keeping your top unrestricted free agents? Yeah, I think we do. Um, you know, we'll be making some moves at some point. We'll have some more cap room at some point. Um, we, we can pretty much sign anybody we want to sign if we can get a deal done. It often takes, as you know, it takes two parties to get a deal done. Uh, what I would say uh, is that uh, I feel like we're in good hands with Nick Matteo and Pat Moriarty kind of leading the charge. Um, I think, you, you can fact check me on this, but I think we've done 22 extensions uh, at over $2 million in the last three years, which I think might be second in the league. The Eagles might have just passed us. 
which frustrates me. But no, I think uh, 22, and I think that's a pretty good number. I think the league average is like 12.8 or 13. So I'm happy with our approach to signing players back. You know, as you guys all know, three years ago, that was a point of emphasis for me, was trying to keep as much talent here. You can't sign everybody back. That's a fact of this game. That's the NFL game. You just can't do it. Uh, especially when you got uh, players that are making good amounts of money. Um, this year, you saw sign Mark Andrews uh, during the season and also uh, Patrick McCary during the season. Um, we try to be as active as possible. We've always got multiple deals out there, dangling, talking to agents. Um, and uh, we've done deals before the season, during the season, after the season, right before the league year starts. And we've done deals like we did last year with Ty Spiles or after free agency started. So I think there's still a lot of potential for us to sign some more guys back. But I am confident that we'll have the resources to sign our own guys back or if we see very good value in the free agency market to maybe target somebody, knowing, as you guys know, that will always also factor in comp picks along the way. Eric, earlier in the week, John expressed his optimism, his confidence that Marcus Peters will be a part of the roster come you know, 2022 fall. Do you share that same sentiment and what needs to happen over the course of this offseason for that to be realistic? Oh, I love Marcus. You know, I, I, I talk to Marcus quite a bit. Uh, you know, Marcus is one of these guys that when he comes to your organization, he provides such an authentic perspective on what this game's all about. And he, he's a Raven. He's one of these rare guys that's played for other teams. And there's been other guys like him. And I can go back over time. And, you know, guys that would come to mind would be guys like Michael McCrary, Anquan Bolden, uh, Steve Smith, Matt Burke. Guys that play for other places, they come in and really change the culture that you have. So uh, I, would, I would expect Marcus to be here. I think he's doing his rehab. I think he's doing extremely well. And I can't wait to see him. I about two other guys. There was a big production made of Anthony Levine's retirement. I'm wondering if you've talked to um, Jimmy Smith or, or what Sam Cook's status is. He's, he's one of your longest tenured players, too. Have you talked to either of them about the end of the road for them? I have not. I have not talked to those two guys. Um, I, I can say that Anthony and I have had discussions. Um, Really, Anthony is a very thoughtful player, probably one of the more thoughtful players I've ever been around. And uh, even as far as going two years back, he'd been thinking about, you know, what his career would look like after football and how he was going to get there. And um, he's prepared himself, you know. Uh, there are a lot of players that think about retirement that want to work in football. Anthony's probably the guy that has actually done the research and really worked hard to put himself in that position. So. Um, you know, Anthony came, went down to the Senior Bowl with us this week. Uh, he was with us. He interviewed players. He's going to help me in scouting. I think he's going to do some work in coaching. I think he's got a great perspective. I think he's respected already by the scouting staff after having spent a week with them. And I'm very excited about what he brings to the table. That, and is Zach or other young players, even Anthony Weaver in your building, mm -hmm. I mean, you remember scouting him in Notre Dame. Yeah, yeah. To see these guys move in that way, mm -hmm. it must be fulfilling to you to mm -hmm. have identified like for football people. People when they come in the building, they, mm -hmm. they love football. Yeah, it's great. You know, I love uh, talking about these careers with these guys, and I love to see players that have a plan, that think about it, and have a plan to get there and accomplish what their dreams might be. Uh, it's funny, too, because I think sometimes they're shocked at what we do and how we do it and what it's like. Um, Anthony said this week he's never walked so much in his life. Um, and, and, and I, you know, but it's rewarding to me to, to be able to see these guys in a different light and to have them see us in a different light. You know, we're not management. We're not their coaches. We're coworkers, and we can do things together, and we can build this great game, and they have a part in it. And I just that's a very, very fulfilling part of this job for me. Um, you know, I mean, even you look at a, a Hall of Fame executive like Ozzy, and, you know, I, I always really have had an appreciation for Coach Belichick and, you know, for giving Ozzy a chance to work in the front office and his coaching and, and scouting and to develop himself into the executive that he is now. And so you do feel like you have a, uh, you have a responsibility if the player really has a strong desire to take these guys and be mentors and help them really yeah, attain, obtain what they think their goals are going to be. Eric, when you talk about players that have played in other organizations, but they come here and they, they play like a Raven, I, I would assume Eric Weddle probably is. Oh, yeah, I forgot players. Eric, but he's still yeah. playing, so yeah. I don't want to mention yeah. him. I was sitting on the couch for two years to see him yeah. play 100% of the snaps in the NFC title game and lead the team in tackles. Just 
Maybe. Yeah, well, I'm not surprised. Uh, you know, Eric is a, a pro's pro, uh, really smart, but does everything the right way. And I couldn't be more happy for him and proud of him. At, some, at one point, again, there's another guy that I would expect that he's going to scout potentially, you know, for the Ravens maybe. But I think he'll get back in football. And uh, I think he coached his – I think he coached his son's high school team this year, and I think they might have won the championship. So he's a dual threat, you know. He's a coach. He's a championship coach, and now he's in the Super Bowl. And I'm, I'm very excited. I, you know, I love Eric. I can probably put him on, uh, on one hand as far as players that I've come to admire and appreciate. Eric, for years, the philosophy, and I don't know if it's changed, was the team would draft and keep an eye on what the division rivals were doing, namely the Steelers. Does that change with the emergence of the Bengals? Uh, yeah, I think I answered that question, I, basically. But it has changed, Jerry. I mean, I, they're talented. Uh, they've got uh, a lot of good personnel. I would say this. Um, over the years, I probably have as much admiration for the Bengals for how they build their team. They find talent. Duke Tobin should really be – I don't want to get in trouble, but he should really be a GM. I mean, he's, he's great. You know, that guy does a heck of a job scouting. And uh, – it would be great to get them out of the division because they, they do a heck of a job. So if you're looking for a GM, look at Duke Tobin. I mean, they, they draft. They've always drafted well with Marvin, with Coach Taylor, uh, with the Brown family. The Bengals have always been a team that, as I look at what they do personnel-wise, I really think they're one of the best. Eric, where do you feel like you are at the safety position right now? I guess specifically what you saw from Brandon Stevens. And I know this is easier said than done, but how much would you like to, to – identify, find a safety that can be a little more dynamic as part of being a playmaker on the back end? Yeah, well, you know, specific to Brandon, I thought he had a nice year. You know, it's certainly as a young player playing a very difficult, challenging position, there was a physical challenge to it, but also a mental challenge to that position. Brandon came in a few years ago, he was a running back, if you think about that, at UCLA. Uh, you know, and then primarily last year was a corner with some safety. So I think what he did this year was pretty impressive. And what I can tell you, he's a talented guy. He's got a lot of physical traits. He's also got a lot of like personality traits that should allow him to really succeed. We expect him to make a jump. That being said, um, you know, I, I would say just in general, especially on the back end, um, our inability this year to create turnovers was probably a, an issue for us. And I would love to see us make the play this year coming up, intercept more passes cause more fumbles, be more disruptive. Um, so if the opportunity presents itself and we see a dynamic corner or a dynamic safety, of course, that would be something that would be attractive to us. You know, when you play these teams, when you play the Steelers, when you play the Browns, when you play the Bengals twice a year and you see their skill players, it becomes imperative that we always have a strong back end with good players in depth as well. And as we saw this year, um, with the attrition that we faced in the secondary, it just overwhelmed us towards the end of the year. And uh, it wasn't the player's fault. I mean, I guess it was my fault. We just didn't have enough good corners. We just didn't have enough guys. At some points, we had a lot of guys that had been on the street or on practice squads playing. And, you know, that's unfortunate. You know, when you lose the quality of players of guys like Marlon and Marcus and Anthony and Deshaun and others, it does take a toll eventually. So I would say the secondary, you know, you've heard us talk about it. And going into the season, we did truly believe that we had a lot of depth. And you can see that because we were able to trade players. We were able to, we, we, we actually cut players that other teams claimed. We had a lot of players this year um, that were playing for other teams that we had in training camp, I, a lot. I mean, maybe six or seven or eight players that were on active rosters this year for other teams. And so I do think that speaks to the quality of the depth that we had going into the season, unfortunately. And then, you know, and I kick myself because would I have liked to have some of these guys at the end of the season? Yes. Unfortunately, you don't always have the mechanism to keep those guys. And so when a trade comes along or, you know, you, you cut a guy and you think you might get him on a practice squad, another team claims him. Um, towards the end of the year, we needed those guys. Eric, I ask you this every time you're available. Have you guys got any um, guidance from the league about the, when the Earl Thomas situation is going to happen, or is, is that anything can settle with that? Uh, you know, I, I would say, Jeff, I'll say what I said last year. That's ongoing. Uh, we'll continue to discuss that in a timely fashion. And um, at some point, you know, maybe, maybe this year, uh, we'll have something to say on that. Eric, being a 
Joe Ortiz interviewed for the New York Giants team opening earlier this offseason. Do you have a consistent succession plan always in place for, for your staff members? And, and two, do you, do you find him to be a coveted potential candidate out there in years to come around the league? Yeah, great question. You know, uh, I've been on both sides of it, you know, so, uh, you know, been here a long time. I had opportunities to, to talk to other teams and, you know, I would have a chance to always look at things maybe through Ozzy's perspective on it. And so what I would say is um, we have a great staff. We're always trying to augment that staff, add guys, assess their abilities, their strengths, their weaknesses. Joe's always been a huge part of that, you know. Um, Joe's smart. He's a great evaluator. He's got a strong voice. He's always been kind of my sidekick, you know, um, for probably the last, I don't know, maybe 11 years, Joe sat next to me in the draft room and uh, just kind of watched what, what we do and how we do it. Uh, I, I was blessed that at an early age in my uh, career here, I had the chance to run the draft. And, uh, and, and really, th that's been a huge help for me. So um, I, think, I think Joe has a great career. He'll be a GM someday. Uh, you know, a smart team is gonna hire him. He's got a great skill set. He's a great collaborator. He's got a great eye for talent. That being said, uh, we got a lot of really good people upstairs. We're always trying to develop these guys and make them the very best uh, that they can be. I've got a lot of faith in guys like George Kokinas, who I've worked with for, man, 25 out of 26 years, I think. And uh, there's nobody better at what George does in terms of pro personnel and college scouting than George. Um, we got other guys upstairs as well. David Blackburn, uh, who's our national scout who lives out in Phoenix. He's an excellent evaluator. Um, a lot of these guys you don't know because it's not really what they do. They don't really deal with you guys, but they're very valuable. Uh, we've also got a, a great analytics staff that we've relied on the last couple of years, especially with COVID, that have really, really helped us in the decision-making process because we haven't been able to go out and see as many guys. We haven't had a chance to test as many players. So we've had to find new innovative ways of getting information. And we've got a great staff upstairs of people that really help me day-to-day -day make decisions. Hey, are you talking about the draft? Uh, we may not talk to you before the draft. Uh, are you planning on bringing it back in-house uh, this season or are you guys gonna go remotely uh, once again? The scouts? No, the uh, draft. draft day. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, the draft will be here. The draft will be here. Uh, I think, I hope, I pray. I mean, I've had it at my house one time, and that was, that's going to be the end of that. Yeah, I won't, because the, the, uh, the, the kicker for that was when the Wi-Fi went down during the draft, and I found out it was because my sons were playing Fortnite. And so that, that's the end. This is the end. You know, we won't be doing that again. So we're either going to have it here, or there'll be a new general manager, because I'm not dealing with it at my house again. Hey, Eric, as far as those conversations with Steve, has anything come up with about um, John Harbaugh's extension? Uh, no, that, you know, that's not something I would be involved with necessarily, and that's not something I'm going to talk about. Of course, I mean, you know, I, I would say that uh, what I will say to you is sitting in the chair that I sit in over the last three years, being across the hall from Coach Harbaugh and having the chance to talk to him every single day, I don't think there's a better head coach in the National Football League. And I uh, appreciate so many different things that he brings to the table. And, uh, you know, I couldn't imagine at this point standing here today any situation where I would not want to be with John Harbaugh for years to come. Um, with uh, at running back, uh, J.K. and Gus, as you know, got injured just before the season. Do you expect, what, what do you expect, uh, your expectations will then return to being back with the team at some point? And how much does that if there is uncertainty impact, how you address that position in free agency and, and the draft? Well, there's always uncertainty at that, you know, with those guys due to the nature of their injuries. That being said, I know both guys. I know their work ethic, determination. Um, you know, we're optimistic, of course, but there's always, an, as we learned this year, there's always going to be an unknown uh, with injuries and how guys respond and how fast they get back. So we'll be... Uh, you know, we'll be conservative, I think, with those guys, for sure. Um, we'll assess the market, we'll assess free agency, we'll assess the draft, and we'll make the best decision we can regarding that position. Certainly, uh, 
expect that those guys will be back at some point. Don't know exactly when, but uh, we're confident. Both guys are young, and so that bodes well in their, in their favor. But we're confident that at some point this year, those guys will be playing football for us. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, guys. Sure.